Okay, so, uh, welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the electron transport chain. Okay, so in this video what we're going to do is now move on to complex 3. So we've seen complex 1 and complex 2 both result in the production of these ubiquinol molecules. We now want to see what's going to happen to these ubiquinol molecules. So, uh, the ubiquinol molecules are within um, the uh, inner mitochondrial membrane, so even once they've had their protons added, they're still an extremely hydrophobic molecule, and they're uh, going to uh, still reside within the hydrophobic core of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay, now the next huge protein complex that's going to be uh, involved in this journey is complex 3. Okay, so they're nicely ordered, uh, well, they're nicely numbered in the order that they occur in the electron transport chain. Okay, and what's going to follow is something called the Q cycle, and this is quite clever. Okay, so, basically, what's going to happen is a molecule of ubiquinone, uh, sorry, ubiquinol, is going to come in. So, what's going to happen, we're going to have to show this in two separate stages. So, what's going to happen is a molecule of ubiquinol is going to come in. Now, there are many important parts of the complex 3. Okay, so within complex 3, there are two uh, cytochrome B molecules. Okay, so here are two separate cytochrome B molecules. Then there is a cytochrome C1 up here, like so. Okay, and then there's also, matched up here, uh, is a cytochrome C molecule. But the cytochrome C molecule isn't part of complex 3. It's going to interact with complex 3. Okay, right. So, basically, we are now set up to go. Also, what's going to come in is a molecule of ubiquinone here. So here is a molecule of ubiquinone. Now, what's going to happen is in comes the molecule of ubiquinol. What's going to happen is it's going to give one of its electrons away. Okay, so it's going to give an electron away, like so. Uh, well, actually, it's going to give both of its electrons away, but we'll track the passage of one of its electrons first. So what's going to happen is one electron is going to move down to this ubiquinone molecule. Now, what happens if you only give one electron to a ubiquinone molecule? Okay, so let's draw out the structure of the ubiquinone molecule, and the only bit that's important is the 1,4-benzoquinone uh, group. So I'm not, well actually, I'll, it doesn't take too much effort, so I might as well just draw the side portions as well. Okay, so here is our 1,4-benzoquinone, and then off the side, of course, we know we have these two uh, methyl esters. We have a methyl group over here, and then we have the isoprenoid polymer here. Okay, so 10 isoprene groups uh, polymerized together. Okay, so I'll bracket around it, put a subscript 10, and then a hydrogen here. So this is the structure of ubiquinone. Okay, right. Uh, so basically, what happens to ubiquinone if you give it one electron? Well, basically, it still breaks both of these bonds here. So what you do is you break the second of uh, the two bonds in these double bonds between these carbon atoms and these oxygen atoms. Okay, and again, imagine giving one electron back to the carbon and one back to the oxygen. Okay, uh, then when these two carbons have three electrons, what will happen is this will return to a benzene ring. So again, it's simpler probably just to imagine breaking one of these uh, double bonds. Okay, giving an electron back to this carbon and an electron back to this carbon. So again, I meant breaking the second of the two bonds within the double bond. And then basically forging a double bond between this carbon and this carbon because both of them have free electrons. And also forming a double bond between this carbon and this carbon because both of them have free electrons. Okay? And then what will happen is one oxygen will receive an extra electron because this is the electron that's been donated. Okay? So one of these oxygens which had an unpaired electron will gain this other electron to pair with its unpaired electron. That will create a negative charge up here. And then the other oxygen will be left with only one electron. 
and um, that will be a free radical basically. Okay, so let me now show you the structure we're going to get. So it's going to have one oxygen with a negative charge up here because this one received the extra electron to pair with its unpaired electron. So it no longer has an unpaired electron, but instead it has a negative charge. And this oxygen down here does have a free electron. Okay, so it's a free radical. And then we've got our benzene ring here. Okay, then we've got our oxygen and our methyl group. Our oxygen and our methyl group our methyl group off here, and then our isoprenoid polymer here, like so, which is unchanged, of course. And I'm sorry about having drawn the double bonds in a different place to where they would have been here. Of course, it doesn't matter, uh, because uh, benzene's um, structure, even if you want to use the double bond um, theory of benzene structure, the idea was that it could leap between the two different structures where it had uh, the double bonds in this position, this position, and this position, and then the double bonds in these positions that could constantly change, basically. And that actually is the origin of the idea of this delocalized ring, basically, that if the electrons were continuously moving around between these two states, then they'd effectively be moving around in rings. Okay, so... This, this structure where you have a free radical and a negative charge, this is known as semiquinone. Okay, and this is denoted by Q with a negative charge and also a dot here. So the dot denotes the free radical, the negative charge denotes the negative charge. Okay, so what happens is this um, um, ubiquinone molecule becomes a semiquinone molecule, uh, also sometimes called a semi-ubiquinone molecule, okay, but more commonly just called semiquinone. Okay, right, and it will actually move onto the other cytochrome B temporarily, but then it will move back onto this cytochrome B, so I might just draw it having moved there temporarily. So here's our semiquinone molecule. Okay, now, of course, this ubiquinone molecule had two electrons to give, so the other electron is going to go on to this cytochrome C1 um, portion of complex 3, and then cytochrome C1 will give that electron to the cytochrome C molecule up here, and then that cytochrome C molecule will go off, and basically cytochrome C lurks within the intermembrane space. Okay, so it will go off, and it will later give that electron to complex 4, as we'll see. Right, uh, now, we are not finished there because, remember, ubiquinone doesn't, sorry, ubiquinol doesn't just give two electrons away, it has to give the two protons away as well. So it will also give the two protons which it had with the two electrons away, and these will go into the intermembrane space. Okay, so here are the movement of the two protons. So this is two protons that have now been moved into the intermembrane space. Okay, now, basically that isn't the end of the story, because at the moment we're left with this semiquinone molecule here, so we need to deal with that. So basically what's going to happen is a whole other molecule of ubiquinol is going to come in. So here comes another molecule of ubiquinol that's in the hydrophobic core of the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And then here is our complex free, uh, which consists of a huge number of proteins again, but uh, the ones that are important for our purposes are these two cytochrome B molecules here. So we have these two cytochrome Bs, and remember I told you that the semiquinone, whoops, this, the semiquinone molecule here had moved onto the other cytochrome B, well it's going to move back now. So here it is, sitting here. I'll try and make it distinguishable. So here's the negative charge, here's the free radical uh, blob. Okay, then we also have cytochrome C1 up here, and in comes a new molecule of cytochrome C. So this is a cytochrome C molecule that hasn't just received an electron. So we have produced one cytochrome C molecule that has an electron now. Uh, that's going to go on to complex 4, but we've now got a separate cytochrome C molecule. Okay, so one that has not been reduced yet. Right, so I'll label these things up. In fact, I might put a bit of colour on here. So we'll have the cytochrome C1 in orange here. So this is cytochrome 
C1. Okay, and then we've got our two cytochrome Bs here in green. And I might show the cytochrome C in red. Okay, so here in green, these are the cytochrome Bs, and I just want to continue the lipid by there on as well. Okay, and then we've also got cytochrome C up here. This has not yet received an electron, so this is uh, unreduced cytochrome C. Okay, so in comes another molecule of ubiquinol. Now, it has two protons to give away and two electrons to give away, and it's going to do exactly the same thing. It's going to give one electron down here, which will go to this uh, semiquinone molecule. Now, what happens to semiquinone when we give it another electron? Well, this second electron that this uh, semiquinone molecule receives is going to pair up with the semiquinone's uh, unpaired electron. Okay, to create another negative charge here. Now, when you have that structure, what happens is two protons come from the matrix of the mitochondria and bind to that structure. Okay, so we've now got two oxygens here with negative charges. So imagine having another electron there. The protons bind to both of these oxygens to create alcohol groups, and then what have we created? We've created a uh, ubiquinol molecule. Okay, which will pass out of complex three and go back into uh, the lipid by there. And this is going to be important when we come to consider the bigger picture of what has happened here. Because although we're putting in two ubiquinol molecules, we're producing another one out again. So it's as though we've only used one ubiquinol molecule. Okay, now what else has this uh, second ubiquinol molecule done? Well, it will pass another electron onto cytochrome C1, which will then pass it onto cytochrome C, which will create another molecule of reduced cytochrome C. And cytochrome C only carries one electron. And I think I'll color in reduced cytochrome C in a different color. So in blue here, this is reduced cytochrome C. Okay, right. Uh, so, um, one last thing to talk about uh, the ubiquinol molecule that came in here, it carried two electrons and two protons. So where have the two protons gone? We've seen where the two electrons have now gone. One went up here, one went down here. But where have the two protons gone? Well, of course, they've been pumped through into the intermembrane space. So now let's take a step back and look at the bigger picture here. We brought in two ubiquinol molecules, but we produced another one. So effectively, we only used one ubiquinol molecule. So we used one ubiquinol molecule. Okay, and what have we done? Well, we've pumped four protons across the membrane. Okay, so we've pumped four protons, two here, two here. Okay, we've also produced two molecules of reduced cytochrome C. Okay, so that's the overall output of the Q cycle. For one molecule of ubiquinol, you pump four protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space, and you also um, you have produce two molecules of reduced cytochrome C. And understand this, cytochrome C uh, only carries one electron. It doesn't carry an electron and a proton. It's different. Uh, to the NAD molecules and the FAD molecules. It carries an electron. Okay, so these reduced cytochrome C molecules are now going to go on to meet complex four. Okay, so let's now talk about complex four. So the final one, if you like, if well, some people call ATP synthase complex five, so I suppose you could view this as not the final one. Uh, but when we consider the, the electron transport chain, usually complex four is considered the final one because, after all, it is the final one in the transport of the electrons. So, once again, here we have complex four, this massive great protein complex that is embedded in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Okay, this side will represent the intermembrane space, this side will represent the matrix of the mitochondria. Now, what will happen is along will come our reduced cytochrome C molecule. So here is reduced cytochrome C. 
Okay, now remember how many electrons does a reduced cytochrome C molecule carry? Well, it's carrying one electron, so here is its one electron. So it's going to come along to complex four, and it's going to give this electron to complex four. Now, in order for complex four to do what it does, it doesn't just need one cytochrome C, it actually needs four of the things. So here come four cytochrome C molecules. So I'll colour them all in in blue. And they are all providing electrons. So we have four electrons coming in here. OK, so here's an electron, here's an electron, here's an electron. They're all coming in. OK, now, uh, complex four is also going to take an oxygen atom from the matrix of the mitochondria, like so. And basically, it's going to use these electrons to reduce oxygen. OK, so what can you imagine happening here? Well, basically, you can imagine cutting both of the bonds here. Finally, I don't have to say, chop the second of the two bonds of the double bond. You are actually breaking both of those bonds, OK? And then you can imagine giving two electrons back to each of the oxygens, because, of course, we've got two covalent bonds here. So um, there's four electrons involved in this bond, and two electrons are provided by each of the members. OK, so give two electrons back to this oxygen, two back to this oxygen. Then what you can do is give two electrons to each of these oxygens, and what you then produce is two O2 minuses. Of course, these are only imaginary intermediates. Uh, and then what you'll do is you'll bring four protons in, and these will come from the matrix of the mitochondria, and you will bind these to those oxygen atoms. And of course, what you will produce then is water, two water molecules. OK, so you're going to bring in these four electrons from the four cytochrome C molecules. You're going to bring in an oxygen molecule. You're going to bring in four protons from the matrix of the mitochondria, and you're going to produce two water molecules. Now, not only do you do that, but you also pump four protons across complex, sorry, across the inner membrane of the mitochondria um, into the intermembrane space, basically. So four protons go from the matrix into the intermembrane space every time you do this, basically. OK, so uh, this is the complex, then, that actually uses oxygen. And this is why this entire process, which we haven't actually finished yet, but I'll give you the uh, fancy word, is known as oxidative phosphorylation. OK, so uh, we're going to see that it's dependent on oxygen. Well, we have seen that it's dependent on the presence of oxygen, basically. Without oxygen, it cannot occur. OK, why it's called phosphorylation is that we're going to phosphorylate ADP into ATP. OK, right. So it's phosphorylation of ADP to ATP that is dependent on oxygen, and it's this complex's action that is dependent on oxygen. OK, and of course... And you might say, well, even if there was no oxygen, that would mean complex 4 couldn't function. But, you know, complex 3 and complex 1 were functioning just fine. And those uh, pumped protons across the membrane, didn't they? Uh, so surely it will be absolutely fine. Surely, you know, it will function without, um, without uh, oxygen, basically. But if you block complex 4 from occurring, uh, then the cytochrome C will all build up as reduced cytochrome C. And that means that complex 3 won't be able to function anymore because if it hasn't got any non-reduced cytochrome C to uh, give the electrons to, then it's not going to function, OK? And further back, if complex 3 is not functioning, then all of the ubiquinone will fill up as ubiquinol, and therefore uh, complex 1 won't have any substrate to work with, so complex 1 will stop. So all movement of protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space will cease if uh, complex 4's actions go down, basically. OK, so uh, we will continue this discussion in the next video where we'll discuss ATP synthase.